Hey, this is Sheldon Primus. Want to welcome you back to the risk management uh, program video. This is video number two. So if you're starting with this video, stop, go to video number one, and then come back to this one. We left off on the hazards of anhydrous ammonia. And what you're seeing here on the screen is just what anhydrous ammonia does. You'll have uh, corrosion to copper, sulfur, uh, silver, uh, aluminum, zilk, zilk alloys, those things that are going to be, they react with the uh, anhydrous ammonia, the liquid ammonia. It also reacts to the body in such a way that just like chlorine, when the moisture in the body, uh, the water that you get mixes with the ammonia, it's going to create some discomfort on your skin on contact. On your right is your uh, your hazardous material identification system code and then your NFPA which is National Fire Prevention Association classification of anhydrous ammonia. These symbols are going to be changing with your new globally harmonized system for classi classification and labeling chemicals. So what you're seeing here is the current system but now with the new GHS it's going to be new symbols, there will be new ratings, and that's what you're going to have to get used to as you um, see more of the GHS labelings. This hair, and you'll see on the bottom of the picture, it's a photo credit of where the picture is coming from. But this is the damage that uh, hydrous ammonia could have to contact of the skin. Some of the hazards is the, the smell up to 25 parts per million is intolerable uh, 25 parts per million is OSHA's permissive exposure limit PEL for anhydrous ammonia above 400 uh, parts per million the skin burns your and your lungs are burning you're coughing because of that at 1700 parts per million it's serious lung damage and 5000 is where you could have some suffocation within minutes of being in the presence of that anhydrous ammonia. So if there's a bulk tank at your facility with anhydrous ammonia, chances are you're right at that 5,000 range, uh, possibly uh, if you're at a, a two, uh, 2,000 or, uh, or 3,000 gallon tank, would be on the lower side. Now when you're dealing with your process this is just a little bit of the hazards of spit back we went over the chlorine the hazards and then we we're going over the uh, properties and the anhydrous ammonia and now going back to the risk management plan in your section four that's where you're talking about your process hazard analysis this is a what if technique that you use what if this happens what's going to be the effect to the process, to my employees, uh, to the general public. That's what the hazard team is assessing. And you do a series of these what-if scenarios and techniques uh, until you can't figure out anymore. You get to the bottom of uh, if anything happens during the loading or unloading. Anything happens in the chemical storage area, what, what will we do? Uh, what will we do with the injectors if there's a problem with them? That's some of the questions your team, your process safety team is going to ask. Uh, we'll put both of these up at the same time so you can see the whole thing while I'm talking it over. But the hazard analysis addresses these items. It's going to address the hazards of dealing with whatever your chemical is on your list of lists. Uh, it's going to identify any previous incidents. That's why in the risk management plan it's asking for a five-year history. Then after you start identifying these things, the next thing you're going to do is figure out how are we going to control if there's a problem? How are you going to control uh, this hazard? And number one way of controlling it is by engineering it out where there is no way feasible for the employees of the general public to uh, have exposure. If that's not possible, the next thing is a work rule where you could work around uh, being in that, uh, having that hazard. You have certain work rules that 
teaches either the employees how to work around it, shows them how to work around the hazard, or uh, just gives you some sort of framework of uh, what you need to do as an association, as a facility, to deal with this chemical that you have. And then the very last method is PPE, because that's saying we have to be around this hazard and we have to handle the hazard we have to ship it, we have to move it, whatever you're doing, you're going to have some sort of interaction with this hazard. And if you have this interaction, then you have to protect yourself and protect your employees and the person dealing and handling that hazard. And that's where your PPE comes in, your personal protective equipment, whether it's gloves or boots or goggles or face shields, whatever it is. You are protecting yourself personally from the effects of this hazard that you're dealing with. And in this case, it's chemical hazards. Uh, the process hazard analysis, continuing with that, you're going to figure out consequences of failure of any one of these systems, engineering, administrative, PPE, and then you're going to have whatever uh, factors involved, human factors, uh, equipment, you're going to take account of all that and then you're going to have a plan uh, in place to, well first this is the analysis stage so I, I won't even get to the plan stage until later, but you're going to, uh, uh, the team is going to analyze what can go wrong, where would it go wrong, what human factors can go wrong, uh, and then you're going to do a qualitative evaluation of the full range of safety and health effects if the controls, uh, if your controls fail for handling your chemical on your risk management plan. Operation procedures. Operators and maintenance personnel shall review the risk management or process safety management plan uh, annually and then they have to sign off that they review this annually. So there's a yearly acknowledgement form and you'll see that in your section 404 in your risk management plan. This is some of the let's go back. These are what you're going to see in your operational procedure portion of the risk management plan. Initial startup, normal startup, normal operations, and uh, normal operations is ch uh, cylinder change out or uh, tank change out, however, whatever quantity you have. Normal operations of your delivery system. Temporary operations if there's something wrong, and I have chlorine as an instance here, so the chlorinator uh, maintenance is a temporary operation. Temporary operation of isolating one side versus the next for maintenance. Normal shutdown, emergency shutdown, you'll have to have a protocol for that, and then start up after the emergency shutdown. So all these things is going to be written protocol step by step of how your facility or your, uh, your place of employment handles your chemical that's on your risk management plan. This section has a training component. Training components is training when someone starts working at the uh, facility that handles or deals with that uh, chemical. It's going to have training for everyone exposed to the hazard. going to have training after any kind of accidental release so everyone can get right back on the same page of this is how we handle our chemical that is on our facility. And uh, then there's remedial training on every component of your plan, uh, initial training, and then a remedial training on every component of the plan. Classroom training should include basic chemical hazard training. Of course, I'm using chlorine here. That's why you say you see the basic chlorine safety. Uh, operating procedures and manuals, emergency response, incident investigation, just having everyone familiarize themselves with all the locations of the plans, the written plans, the location of where the chemical is, where your uh, spill kits are, everything that has to do with uh, dealing with 
your hazard uh, hazardous chemicals should be part of this classroom training and in part of this classroom training uh, at the end have a pass or fail requirement so you know if your uh, training is effective or not and that pass or fail uh, requirement 75 would be your lowest you don't want to say a passing grade is 60 because that's not uh, that's not effective training so 75 will be your should be your lowest contractors when you have contractors on site your contractors need to know what they're working around so though uh, the contractors are may have a completely different job and uh, this picture here is showing some contractors uh, putting in a T for a pipe and they may have nothing to do with a process uh, that handles anhydrous ammonia, sulfur dioxide, chlorine gas, but if they're going to be working around it, uh, it's imperative that they know exactly what is they're working on. They have a right to know the chemicals that is in their immediate vicinity. And the contractor's responsibility is to ensure that their employees are trained uh, as to the same training that you have for your process safety management and your risk management program. Pre-startup, here's uh, the next sections that we're doing is going to kind of give you tips for the, the, the each of the little portions of the risk management plan. So the pre-startup safety, that's if changes are made in the existing facility, uh, I'll say chlorine just to keep up with the slide, chlorine process, or if new regulated processes is constructed, a review of the process must be done to verify that the system safety has not been compromised. Now that's your pre-startup safety review before anything happens. Then you have a nice little checklist to go over of uh, every one of these points are what you're going to review and don't forget that there's also a management change portion of that and a management change just simply means if there's a portion of your system that needs to be updated or or, or all the system there's some change coming you have to notify your regulator beforehand that there is going to be a change uh, in your risk management plan because everybody has to know about the change, uh, not only your facility, but everyone else that's involved in your risk management, your local emergency management. Everyone has to know what's going on. So if they have old, outdated information, it's not going to help them if there's a need for any kind of, um, any kind of emergency uh, response. A mechanical integrity portion of your plan is just to make sure that every piece of machinery that is needed to handle their uh, hazardous chemical is completely mechanically sound. And there's this is the portion of your risk management plan that addresses that. Hot works perm permit. Anybody working with any sort of brazing or welding around the chemical process could react with the chemical. If there's a hot work that uh, needs to be done in that area, there should be a hot work permit, including a fire watch, which is 30 minutes after the hot work is complete, just to make sure that there is no fire uh, that could you know, stretch into your process area. This slide is telling you just a little bit more. Um, and it's not just your facility, uh, excuse me, your employees, but any contractors that are doing any hot work around uh, a process that has high chemicals. There was a situation in Daytona Beach some years ago where the city employees were welding around a highly uh, combustible uh, bulk tank, and it did end up in a fatality. Your management of change, 
the biggest portion of knowing your management of change is any change in your system uh, has to be, you have to properly identify and review what the chain reaction is to that change before you implement the change and if it's a significant change then you have to notify your uh, your regulators these are different components that are applicable changes and this is uh, on the left side if say you have a new facility about to be built and now you used to have uh, only two or three tons cylinders of uh, let's say chlorine then your plant now is going to upgrade and you're going to have six to seven then that's a significant change and the regulation in states that you do need to do a management of change and submit the formal paperwork for that incident investigation each investigation uh, has to, excuse me, each incident that results in or could result in a catastrophic release of the chlorine yeah, must be investigated and of course substitute chlorine with whatever chemical you're dealing with. I use chlorine as a theme here in the slides only because uh, that's one of the gas chlorine is one of the uh, things that are used most in disinfection for wastewater treatment and that was what I had in mind when I was making this presentation so excuse me if I do say chlorine a lot in the slides and you, your facility is using something else don't feel that it doesn't apply to you because I'd say specifically chlorine all these things apply to people with a risk management program so incident investigation you have to describe any incident that happens step by step by step from the beginning of the accident, events leading up to it, the release of the chemicals, and then the follow-up after. Everything has to uh, be included. And then at the very end is your recommendation to how to prevent anything from happening, uh, any catastrophic release from happening again. And I mentioned about the notifications who that you have to notify your regulators. So this is who gets notified. The local Department of uh, Environmental Protection, whatever state, some states don't have the wording Department of Environmental Protection, they have water quality or whatever your state is that's the equivalent to your uh, Environmental Protection Agency at the state level. They're the ones that get the notification. And then there's also regulatory uh, bodies that could be regional or on a local level. And you will know that because it's in your previous risk management plan. Uh, those are the people that need to know. They have to have a date, your facility name, location, and it's good to have your location, not only your physical address, but GPS, the location of your process so it, they know exactly where the, the bulk tank is by a GPS locator. The amount of chemical released, the date, the time of the release, when you discovered it, because sometimes it may have happened. Uh, let's say you have a telemetry system and it's monitoring the tank level. Something happens and your tank level goes way off on the telemetry system and there's an alarm that is sounded. If that alarm is sounded, but yet there's no operator monitoring the computer, he may not get that notice until he or she comes back to their uh, station. And when they get back to their station, they see an alarm and may have been going for 10, 15 minutes. At that point, you're recording. This is what time we acknowledge the alarm. And in most cases, the alarm system itself has um, acknowledgement uh, by whom and at what time so you can go back follow your logs on your uh, main supervisory control acquisition data uh, system that your your, uh, your SCADA system and that is a good way to know who cleared the alarm what time they cleared the alarm 
and put that in your incident report. Describe any injuries or damage. You're going to uh, write down the method of controlling uh, anything from happening in the future. So that goes right back to your incident investigation. That's what your notification is going to include. And then you have to have a name, a signature, and a title of the person submitting the letter. If it's the compliance officer, or if it's the executive director, a chief operator, whoever is the responsible person for the risk management plan, they're the person that are going to be submitting this or if your utility says no one below a chief operator or a director is going to submit paperwork to uh, a local or federal agency, then you're going to have to make sure you apply by those rules of your specific uh, utility. Your incident form, that's what we went over before, that's your employee incident forms. Uh, so the first one we had like an accident investigation those are the forms we go in and then there's also an employee incident form that can, uh, that goes into this this plan and in the notification compliance audits you have to do these audits three years it's a self-evaluation of how your program is working if it's effective or not this audit can be a third party audit or it could be a party uh, that is knowledgeable of how to do audits in your um, municipality or in your system. I do these third party audits as part of utility compliance so if you need someone to do a third party, a third party audit just reach me at Sheldon at utilitycompliance.com and I'll send you out a free quote especially mention that you're taking my class and you needed, uh, you saw that you needed to do an audit, and I will help you with that. Your primary goal for this audit is you want to make sure you gather significant data to verify compliance of your process safety management requirements, and that you're doing good process practices, safe practices, using any controls available to control the hazard, engineering, administrative, PPE, if you identify issues that come up in this uh, compliance audit, then you're going to have to not only say, here's the issue, who is going to be the person responsible for abating the issue and in what time frame. So just don't say, here's an issue, it needs to be, it needs to be addressed, a regulator uh, isn't working, so it needs to be addressed, or the scale system doesn't work and we have to address it then who's going to address that scale system? Is it going to be the maintenance foreman? Is it going to be a person that is uh, maybe an operator, but they're the ones who are going to be assigned to make sure that uh, that scale is not only com uh, completely repaired, but everyone is notified that the scale is back online. So that's what you give a time frame as well as when that has to be done. Put these all up at once. Your audit is you're digging in. That's why you get that picture on the microscope. You're digging in to uh, make sure that there's no stone unturned. And audits are different than inspections because with audits, you're giving a number system. Excuse me, as my drink a little. All right. So with your number system, then you know exactly. We scored very high in this area, or we scored a little low over here, and we need to address that score. Specifically, that score will also indicate if you're way off the mark or if you're fairly close to where you should be, but you need to uh, come to speed by whatever specific measures you have. How this is on the audit side on the regulators. So if a regulator says we need to audit a facility, this is the mindset of the regulator. This is how a plant is selected to have an audit. If there's a previous or current accident history of a facility, you're a good candidate for an audit. Overall accident history of the facility in the same industry. Let's, uh, would make you a good candidate. 
your facility location and proximity to population centers, meaning if you have a large population in your cone of influence, your circle of influence, then that's a good reason for an auditor to come visit you. Chemical characteristics, quantities of your risk management plan, regulated chemicals on site, compliance with or inspection by allied uh, agency program, meaning if uh, you had some sort of other regulatory body that was doing an inspection or an audit at your facility or even just called out at your facility and they may have noticed, hey, you guys have a lot of anhydrous ammonia. I think I'm gonna need to call the uh, Department of Emergency Management uh, just so that they could take a look at you. So that now is you are being referred to a regulatory body from another entity. So that's by referral. Results of a compliance audit, if it was a very bad audit previously, you may have to do another one. And then there's some neutral or random oversight uh, issues that will get a, an audit for you and some other factors by the Department of Emergency Management. And that could be public, someone in the public may have said, uh, felt the concern and talked to the DEM and asked you to ask them to take a look at the facility nearby them just to make sure that everything is working well. Basic desk audit, your initial phase of your audits, you're gonna focus on the data complaining, your risk management summary, uh, compliance with the plan, and you're gonna do some sort of checklist first to make sure that everything is, is covered uh, in your risk management plan. Determine the follow. Check the rules again. Maybe you may have switched from one tier to the next. Uh, you could uh, go up or down. So just review again and see, okay, is my facility at the same rating it was the last time we had to do an audit? There might be a different level for you. Uh, you're going to look over the completeness and the adequacy of the data in the risk management plan and then all review everything for completeness. And that's the first stage of your uh, audit. Then the second second stage is going to have an audit no, uh, notification letter, and that's coming from the regulatory body. They're going to request that you send all this information regarding their risk management plan to them. They're going to look for your process hazard analysis. That's what your PHA is any training records, all your paperwork regarding your process. Uh, even some maintenance schedules may be asked for at this time. Uh, any of that supporting documentation. Then they're gonna schedule to take in time to come out and visit. Plant tour or facility process uh, is what they're gonna look at when they get there. They're gonna look at uh, all your documentation, interviews, some of your uh, employees going to develop it. at the end they're going to look and see if there's any deficiencies and then see if there you could start developing and implement any of the required RMP elements that you have uh, that they identify for you. I've been through uh, personally some of these audits uh, through uh, the Department of Community Affairs so it's a very good, good meeting, especially if you have all your ducks in a row, that you take the time and you pay attention to detail. That's why I prefer doing a risk management face-to-face -face with the client as opposed to them uploading data that some other people do, where you just upload data and you never have a face-to-face, -face. you never really see, go and walk a facility you don't know what it looks like, all you know is the data that's given to you. Uh, you that's, so when an audit's being done, a compliance audit, and you're representing this client saying that uh, their uh, documentations are all in order, yes, that may be true, the documentation's all in order, but a physical walkthrough will tell you if the actual documentation matches 
what is out in the field. Here's what you could do for prepare for an audit. Obtain and organize your risk management and support documentation prior to the schedule of the audit date. Uh, you're doing a quick self audit whenever you get that letter saying, all right, we need to come out and see your facility. Start getting prepared. Look over your process hazards analysis, or you may call it a, a job safety analysis, a JSA. Look over that stuff. Look over your SOPs. Look over your hazard assessments, your training, maintenance logs, management of change, step by step by step. Anything in that RMP plan is subject to be audited. So look over it like if you're auditing it yourself and do a self audit before they even get there. Moving on with what to expect when you do have the audit, and I'm putting these all up at once. They'll come in, have an audit team person ready. I like to be there with my clients, so if they're getting audited, I'm right there with them, and we'll go through it together. So you have your audit team, you have your local emergency planning committee staff member uh, could you know, be invited. Let's say there's someone with uh, the fire department that wants to go through this with you, you could invite them as well. But there'll be an audit agenda, an assignment, which is, this is gonna be the scope of the audit, and that's what your audit agenda is gonna tell you. You have an opening conference where they'll show you credentials, this is who we are, they'll give you a card, and so you know that they are who they say they are. Then they'll tour the facility, review all your documentation, interview any staff if they need to and then at the end they'll get back together in a room say this is what we found uh, here's your deficiencies here's recommendations uh, you'll get a, they'll tell you that you'll get a report on this an official report some uh, regulators may be able to do it directly uh, at their station the uh, portable station meaning a laptop and then they'll uh, just send you a copy of everything with dates that you need to hit uh, your uh, compliance dates. This slide is telling you what to expect after the on-site audit and I kind of mentioned that earlier but after the audit you're gonna get your your time that you need to uh, you, you have an abatement period for deficiencies and that's where you have to go out, fix the problem, assign it to someone, give them a due date that is far uh, closer or far earlier than the due date on your abatement uh, so that you don't uh, have something that comes up over the blue and now you're going to have to ask for an extension. So make sure that timetable is uh, that you give someone to fix the problem is going to give you enough of a window before your uh, Department of Community Affairs timetable is, and that's a buffer for yourself. Facility response to an audit report have to be uh, within the timetables. Usually it's 60 to 90 days of correction or revision. Uh, you have a written request for an extension prior to a deadline if you need it, so you can use that option. Upon receipt, of the review of your required information, DEM issues, the final determination report. If the information is correct and complete, then that's what they're going to send you. And uh, if it's not completed, then they're going to uh, give you some, uh, like a little nudge letter saying you need to complete this. And then there's a interim audit report if necessary. Common deficiencies, these are things that they find in the uh, Department of Emergency Management. Uh, inadequate documentation, They're either it's not developed completely or you don't really have a good one uh, or you don't have one at all. So that's a, a deficiency. Uh, unimplemented prevention program or components, a good program but it's not implemented, meaning Someone like myself, a consultant, gives you a great program to follow, but then there's no follow-up after that. There's no uh, actual implementation of the plan and then incomplete documents.
specific excuse me, on-site audit findings, mechanical integrity, a PM protocol. If you do preventative maintenance, record all that preventative maintenance because that's a great thing to hand the regulator saying, this is our maintenance plan. Here's the last uh, few maintenances uh, that we did on the piece of equipment. It shows on the maintenance program who did what, what, uh, what they did as far as uses of uh, parts, what parts were used, how they did the work, the lubricants were right for whatever it is that they're uh, doing a preventative maintenance. If that uh, PM paperwork is very detailed, it's going to help the regulator be at ease because they could see step by step what the plant did to make sure that the equipment is maintained well enough to support the hazardous chemical. Operating procedures show them details on this is exactly how we start up a process, how we shut down a process, and that kind of information, the detailed information, is what puts a regulator at ease. Your training and documentation of your training, and then your process hazard analysis or your job hazard analysis, you're going to do that and you're going to make sure that your hazard analysis is including for uh, or it does have a portion for you know, rain events, hurricane events, uh, earthquake events, whatever it is in your uh, part of the U.S. that you have or globally, whatever that uh, issue is, add that into your, into your plan. Uh, other on-site audit findings, management of change, contractor safety program, emergency response program, all these things, have, that's some of the, the criteria that they're going to check in your uh, audits. Your OSHA process safety management, program level three processes, those are those level processes that are very high up, uh, a lot of uh, bulk chemicals that uh, or a high quantity of bulk chemicals puts you in a different program level. Uh, I'll, that's a, a related regulation. Your tier two reports, your annual reports, that's showing how you handle your chemicals. That's another uh, regulation. And then accident notification, whatever your state warning point has to be within 15 minutes of release uh, at certain quantities. So within you know, 15 minutes, you need to call your state warning point, and that's in section 304 of your requirements. And uh, I do all your, I can do all your risk management plan, your audit service, prepare one, deregulate it, annual compliance training, or tier 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 two reporting annually. You could do that as well. So you have the email down there for info at utilitycompliance.net. You have Sheldon at utilitycompliance.com, or you could even do Sheldon at utilitycompliance.net, and I could be an available resource for you. Your trade secrets will be protected. So if you're a, uh, a company and not a utility that has anhydrous ammonia, your trade secrets will be protected and it's not going to uh, go to your competitors. Yeah, section 5 of that report is your uh, your emergency response and that's your spill control plan. You have that spill of accidental release. Your emergency response program has to incorporate who needs to be uh, who needs to be notified in what time frame and sometimes you you just have it by title as opposed to names because people may come and go but the title will still be there so if you say contact chief operator and this is a phone number that all the chief operators that ever was on your facility have had this phone number then that's great or just make sure the numbers are up to date but some sort of emergency action, emergency coordination and uh, responsibility from 
the hazmat team with your uh, local fire rescue, they have to be informed and they need now to know who's going to be the incident commander. If it's the utility safety officer or the chief operator, whoever's on site, and that you work hand in hand with the hazmat people to make sure that it is uh, completely, the, the emergency is going to be handled between the two entities very well. Uh, here's a major release for chlorine as an example. If it exceeds 10 parts per million in the atmosphere where there's actually a chlorine cloud, that's a major, uh, a major release that a hazmat team is going to have to come out. Uh, major leaks, when those happen, you should have some sort of emergency route that everybody knows we need to go this route and we're meeting at this certain place and so everyone could be accounted for. All heads is a head count. And that's predetermined and written. Uh, medical emergencies. No employee may attempt to rescue in the chlorine release area. Meaning if there's an emergency, don't attempt to uh, try to put on some bandages or, or whatever to address that emergency or that uh, accident in the chlorine release area because you will be consumed with that chemical and whatever it is uh, could affect you. So now it's going to be two people that are going to be down versus one. So you grab the employee that is injured and you get them to a safe area first and then apply your medical or first aid treatment. Your reporting requirements. Within five days after a release, uh, and that has to be to your local emergency planning advisory committee. They get that notification and on the right is all the information that you need to put on that notification of the release. It's your who, what, when, where, how, uh, what you did, emergency actions, how you responded, who responded. That's all kinds of information that you need to put in there to make sure that there is you don't leave any stone unturned when it comes to reporting a release of any chemical. Your appendix in your risk management plan is going to have your process safety uh, for your highly hazardous chemicals. You're going to have your MSDS sheets, which are now going to be your SDS sheets, safety data sheets, as your globally harmonized system, GHS system, starts getting implemented. And then you have recommendations from your ANSI, American North, uh, National Standard Institute, on the formatting of your uh, MSDS sheets, but the MSDS components, these 16 components, is now in your new globally harmonized system. And this is the big purple book. That's what they, uh, they call it, the big purple book of your globally harmonized system. So we're going to take a quick little break. And uh, then we're going to kind of go over the GHS system. And after that, that will be pretty much the, the end of this video uh, session. You know, so we'll go over GHS, we'll go over a few other things you know, related to the risk management plan and wrap it up for you. So we're going to take a nice uh, little break for me. Uh, for you, you're just going to slip over to the next video, and that's risk management video three. So I will see you on the scene.